Good morning. Welcome back. We are now at Luke chapter 22. And Father, we thank you for this wonderful morning. We thank you that we can come before your throne of grace once again to study your word. And so we ask this morning, Lord, that you open our understanding that we might comprehend the scriptures and to find applications. So we commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you look at the screen, I have for you at this, uh, 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 on, on this screen, the book of Luke in one verse. If you remember when we covered Luke chapter 19 verse 10, the verse read or reads, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And in this one verse, it actually, uh, it actually captures the whole book of Luke. So if you read chapters 1 to 4, it is about the Son of Man. The Son of Man came. And that's what we have covered. And then in chapters 5 to 21, it is about the Son of Man. He came to seek and now, as we embark on chapter 22, this is the third and last section of this book. And this is the Son of Man coming to save. He came to save. Now, uh, last week in the lesson, I, I, I did prepare two slides, uh, but I did not go through. That is for your reference, for you in your own study, uh, together. Uh, with Matthew chapter 24, you look at Luke 21 as they relate to Revelation chapter 6 because all these predictions and all these prophecies that Jesus gave and recorded in Matthew and Luke, they shall come to pass in the tribulation. And these are all recorded for us by the Apostle John in Revelation 6. So, do... Uh, take a look at them. We will definitely cover them when we revisit the book of Revelation in the years ahead. And then the other slide, it's, uh, it covers the 70th week, uh, the first half of the tribulation, and then the second half of the tribulation, and then the conclusion of that week, when Jesus shall come thereafter. So um, that is for your self-study, for your reference. Uh, as I said, we will cover more of this in detail when we look at the book of Revelation. So today, we are looking at the third section. The first of this is Luke chapter 22. And looking at the outline on the screen, you have the betrayal by Judas, verse 1 to 6. Secondly, we have the Last Supper, verse 7 to 38. And Jesus Gethsemane prayer verse 39 to 46 and the fourth uh, topic here is Jesus arrest and Jewish trial verse 47 to 71 it is quite a long chapter we probably cannot cover all in one sitting so I'll likely do it in two over two weeks this week and next week so let's begin the betrayal by Judas verse 1 now the feast of the unleavened bread drew near which is called Passover and the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might kill him for they feared the people now just a quick uh, recap of this feast of uh, Israel I have got this diagram for you now you know every year in Israel they celebrate the seven feasts and if you look at this diagram the seven feasts are number one the Passover looking at my pointer and then you have the feast of the unleavened bread then the feast of the first fruits then the Feast of Pentecost, Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and lastly, the Feast of the Tabernacles or Booths, 
We have covered this thoroughly when we studied Leviticus chapter 23. But just as we begin Luke chapter 22, I thought I'd show you this because uh, the Passover is uh, in the month of Nisan, which is the first month in the Jewish calendar. And it is celebrated on the 14th day of the month of Nisan. And immediately following for the next seven days from the 15th to the 21st is the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. And this is the occasion that is referred to by Luke. Even as we look at the, as we look at Luke chapter twenty two verse one. Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called the Passover. So just before the feast of the unleavened bread is the Passover, the celebration of that meal, the remembrance uh, of God's deliverance of their exodus from Egypt years ago and during this uh, passover feast as i have mentioned previously jerusalem it was full of people minimally uh, two million people because uh, all the men and they, they must come and and, and the, they brought they probably brought their family members as well and with so many people in the city of jerusalem Security was tight, and that's why even Pilate and Herod, they were in town. Normally, they would be uh, secluded somewhere, enjoying their good life in, for example, Caesarea uh, by the sea, Mediterranean Sea, and it's a beautiful seaside resort. We, we have gone on, on, on the trips and we have visited that place, and it is a beautiful place, and they will normally be hanging out there. But because it is the feast of the Passover, they did not want any rebellious activities, any insurrection, because that would upset Rome and it wouldn't go well for them as uh, the governors and, 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 and rulers over this Jerusalem. So they were in town. So, verse 2, and the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might kill him. Now all the people gathered in Jerusalem for the purpose of worshipping God to celebrate the feast. But here you have the religious leaders having a different agenda. And it was nothing to do with the word of God. It was their own agenda and they wanted to kill Jesus. And it was already decided. There wasn't even a trial yet. And they already decided in their mind that Jesus is guilty and Jesus needs to be uh, eliminated. So, they decided to do it after the Passover. Not, not during the Passover. You, you read, uh, we just read, for they feared the people. Here they are plotting the greatest crime in history and they want to do it after the Passover, after the people have all dispersed and have gone back to their hometowns or wherever they came from. And then they want to arrest Jesus and kill him. But that wasn't the plan of God. God's timetable is that Jesus, the perfect lamb, shall be sacrificed at the Passover and nothing that these religious people sought to do will disrupt or change God's timetable and so we just read the timetable of the religious leaders it's uh, intended for after the Passover when they will kill Jesus for they feared the people verse 3 then Satan entered Judas then Satan entered Judas, named Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. Now, Satan entered, not, not a demon, but Satan himself entered. And it wasn't just tempting Judas, but Satan entered Judas. Now, 
there, there, there have been uh, questions asked, you know, uh, if, if Judas was uh, chosen, then why, why uh, was he a traitor if he was chosen after an all-night prayer by our Lord Jesus? Well, why did he end up being a betrayer? And why did he allow, allow uh, him, himself to be open to such demonic things? But you see, even as as um, Jesus had chosen not only Judas, many others, but every individual has a choice to accept or to reject, to obey or to disobey, or to continue in obedience or walk away from obedience. So this is the case of a. Judas, who was a dishonest treasurer, who, who took money from the till. And so, I, I will cover a bit more later why Judas was chosen. So, verse 3, Then Satan entered Judas, surname Iscariot. If you look at the name Iscariot, you know he came from the south. And he came from this place called Kirioth, Kirioth if I can pronounce it correctly. Now, I also have uh, another diagram on the screen for you, uh, showing you all the seven fees, the, the, the significance of the fees, and what had been fulfilled and what is coming soon. So, it is for your study. Please take time to, to read through and investigate further. Now, this is Judas. And he came from this place in the South Kirioth. And of all the 12 apostles, uh, disciples, following Jesus, he was the only one who was educated. The rest were, were, were just uh, fishermen and others, tax collectors, uh, but the most educated person was Judas. And he came from a well-to-do background, from the south. The rest were from the north. He was from here, Kiro. The rest of the disciples were from the northern region, the Galilee region. So, then Satan entered Judas, surname Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. And did Jesus not know about him? Of course, Jesus knew. If you read John chapter 6, verse 64, even Jesus said, in John chapter 6, verse 64, that, but there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew, for Jesus knew he was, he was addressing the disciples and he said, for Jesus knew, it is written, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. And he said, therefore, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. And Jesus, even at this stage, knew that one would betray him. If you jump to the bottom, verse 70, Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve? Yeah, he did. He prayed overnight, then he chose the twelve. And one of you is a devil. One of you is used by the devil. Now, you see, Jesus knew who, but he did not identify that person. This is being merciful. This is showing grace that this person would be convicted and that he would repent. He might own up publicly or even just to Jesus privately and repent of his sin. And this was Jesus giving him a chance to turn around, turn back to God, turn back to Christ. But he didn't. Okay? So, then Satan entered Judas, surname Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. So he went, verse 4, so he went his way and conferred with the chief priests and captains. So you see, this was Judas on his own initiative. He left the godly people. This, this guy, this Judas, a treasurer but dishonest treasurer, now he took the initiative 
and he left the godly people and went to the ungodly people and conferred with the chief priests and captains. Now these captains, these are temple police and these are not Roman police, these are Levitical police, these are uh, Jews. And they were guarding and watching over the temple. So he went to confer with the chief priests and captain. So he really made their job easy. They did not have to approach him. How would they imagine that of the 12 who have been with Jesus all this couple of years, so close to him, why would they suspect that one of them would be a traitor? But now that he came forth, he took the initiative, he made their job easier. How he conferred with the chief priests and the captains, how he might betray him to them, how he might betray Jesus to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. This guy loves money. He's in charge of the treasury. And agreed to give him money. And if we look at John chapter 12, Just so we can better understand this Judas is Iscariot. So if you look at John chapter 12, verse 4, But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Verse 6, This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box and he used to take what was put in it so even as we just read the devil the satan devil you know entered into him but his character way before this incident before satan entered into him he was already in his own moral weakness he had already been stealing money so he was opening his door for devil, for the devil and Satan to come into him. And that was Judas. And some scholars said likely he, he was expecting a political messiah. He was expecting Jesus to come and set up that kingdom on earth. And when he did, he, this Judas wanted to be well placed amongst those who will rule and reign uh, the kingdom with Jesus. But now that Jesus has made it so clear that he will go to the cross and he will die, he thought, well, in that case, he might as well cash in on his asset, so to speak. Now that Jesus is of no value to him, Jesus uh, uh, is not setting up his earthly uh, political kingdom and he cannot have his place, then why not he just go and, and uh, make some money out of this and for that he betrayed our Lord Jesus. So, verse 6, So he promised and sought opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of the multitude. So, like the religious leaders, he thought, he would plan this uh, for Jesus to be arrested after the Passover in the absence of the multitude. But if we just take a step back, Judas, he was given the same message as the rest of the disciples. He was given the same authority like them. He was sent out like them. But why? Why, having done the ministry, why did he betray Jesus? Well, for the few reasons I've just given to you before this, it was him. It was him. And Jesus had said in Matthew 7, some who will come to him in the last days and say, did we not heal? Did we not pray? Did we not teach? Did we not deliver? But Jesus said, I do not know you. And surely, surely, he would say to Judas, I do not know you. So let's be uh, careful. A church membership does not equate to salvation. And even for leaders, leaders in the church, not 
not all leaders, not all leaders can be assumed to be true believers. Some could be phony believers. They may not be easily spotted. And I'm sure whatever they are doing, they will destroy the works of or intend to destroy the works of Jesus. So that we have just covered is the first um, item, the betrayal by Judas, verse 1 to 6. So now let's go on to the second one, which is the Last Supper from verse 7 to thirty. Eight. Verse 7 Jesus and his disciples prepared the Passover and by doing this by giving instructions to his disciples to pre prepare the Passover Jesus was forcing the hands of his enemies his enemies wanted to wait until after the Passover but that is not a God according to God's timetable. And so Jesus had to initiate this. So preparing for the Lord's Supper, verse 7, Then came the day of the unleavened bread, that is immediately after the Passover feast, when the Passover must be killed. Okay, sorry. Then came the day of the unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. They have not eaten yet. I'm sorry. Okay, this is according to God's timetable. And for the preparation, and he sent, verse 8, and he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat. So they said to him, Where do you want us to prepare? Now, it just seemed so simple in one sentence go and prepare the passover for us and he told this to peter and john well we have learned so far that these two were not perfect disciples but they were faithful and they were the part of the inner core together with james uh, inner core of jesus and so they were called and they responded in faith. They said, so where do you want us to prepare? They did not say, why us or how? They just said, where? Where do you want us to prepare? And, and that is faith. They were not questioning. They were, uh, uh, why them? And uh, it, wouldn't it be dangerous? It would be hostile. Uh, can't we just eat outside? No. According to Deuteronomy chapter 16, uh, verse 5 and verse 6, it must be eaten within the city, in Jerusalem. The meal must be eaten in Jerusalem. And Jesus sent Peter and John. And this Peter and John were only identified and recorded by Luke, not in the other gospel writers. Go and prepare the Passover for us. And that meant that Peter and John had to go and buy a lamb, unblemished lamb, and then go to the temple and have it sacrificed. No, I mean, sorry, slain. Slain at the temple, and then roasted, and then they had to go prepare the, the, the room and all the other items of the meal, the herbs, the wine, the unleavened bread, all this involved preparation. It wasn't like they went to the room and then everything was there. So this is a big job. Go and prepare the Passover that we may eat. And they went obediently. So they said to him, where do you want us to prepare? Verse 10, and he said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house which he enters. Then you shall say to the master of the house, The teacher says to you, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large furnished upper room. 
they make ready now it is still a debate uh, was it a word of knowledge that Jesus gave to Peter and John or was it prearranged now that is not important I know that our Lord is sovereign he can arrange things he can prearrange things he can do anything but the important thing is it happened just as he said so it happened just as Jesus said the word of God is powerful and it came to pass so he told them you enter the city uh, you will see a man carrying a pitcher now it is not typical it is not usual usually the 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 woman would be carrying the pitcher of water during that time yeah not that it has changed much today but uh, during that time usually the woman will carry the pitcher of water so you you can't miss such a man if you see him that he is carrying a pitcher of water and jesus said follow him into the house which he enters then he will say to the master and then they, why did jesus i mean the sovereign lord why did he not get, just give the address you know number 33 chai chi road that's it you know why did he not just give the specific address because he did not want judas who was in their midst to know because if G judas had known the exact address he might have arranged for the betrayal to take place sooner than what jesus intended jesus intended to celebrate the passover and he did not want to be betrayed before that so that's why he did not give direct instructions to conceal it from judas so follow him you see the man follow him into the house which he enters then you shall say to the master this master must be rich because it's a big house the teacher says to you where is the guest room where i may eat the passover with my disciples then he will show you you see the power of the word of god it brings about obedience and so he will show you a large furnished upper room there make ready verse 13 so they went in faith as i mentioned earlier then so they went and found it just as he had said to them and they prepared the passover just like when jesus told his disciples to go into town and then go and get the the donkey and bring the donkey to him it happened just as he had said to them and they prepared the passover and remember the passover is to remember the exodus from egypt a picture of sin a picture of the world in sin so it was the exodus from egypt verse 14 jesus institutes the lord's supper when the hour had come he sat down and the 12 apostles with him now you have seen pictures i've shown you before it's not like they sat down as we sit down today they, they recline they recline with their feet behind and then they lean forward yeah on their arms so when the hour has come come for what for the passover feast to be celebrated and on this occasion it will be the last meal that jesus will share with them and with it will come the first communion holy communion that jesus will institute you see the the passover as i mentioned it was it was to remember their exodus from egypt and in this meal the lamb the lamb was sacrificed the lamb was a substitute the lamb was a substitute the lamb's blood was posted on the doorposts 
and also on the lintel so that the angel of death will pass over the door and the Jews who are behind the door will be saved because the angel of death will pass over them and move on to the next house if it does not have the blood on the lintel and on the poles the firstborn in that home shall be killed so they that is the passover now we have jesus in their midst and celebrating the final his final meal with them the last supper and this passover was a symbol of jesus death and with Jesus' death, it would usher in the kingdom. So, we look just now at the, in Exodus, I mean, we, we have seen in Exodus 12, the original uh, uh, institution of the Passover. That was, that was to, for the Exodus. And there was bloodshed because without, the shedding of blood there is no redemption and so there was the the substitute lamb that died and the blood shed and posted on the door so now you see even as jesus shared this meal with them with this jesus is the substitute there will be a substitute and that substitute in this case is jesus he will be the substitute and by the shedding of his blood there will be exodus from sin not exodus just from egypt physical but this is exodus from sin this is deliverance from the bondage with sin this is spiritual and jesus will do just that that we shall be redeemed and when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we remember the Lord's death. So we look back to what He has done for us. We remember the Lord's death till He comes. We look forward to the complete fulfillment of His kingdom at His return. It is such a wonderful experience and such a wonderful uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, significance of what this Passover and what this uh, final meal and the, the first Holy Communion, what it meant to them and to us. So let's read this again. When the hour has come, verse 14, He sat down with, uh, He sat down and the twelve disciples with Him. Then He said, to them with fervent desire with earnest desire i really want to i really want to i really want to bring about an exodus from sin for each and every one of you i have desired to eat this passover with you i have desired to eat this passover with you it wasn't another annual feast another ritual that they had to do so they assembled in jerusalem and jesus with them and so they celebrated no this is special and jesus wanted to do it with them special to jesus before i suffer before i suffer now this is still very difficult for the disciples the 12 to to comprehend fully now you notice with the 12 that means judas was still there and he participated in the last supper so i have desired to eat this passover with you before i suffer for i say to you i will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom jesus was looking beyond the cross and to the day when his whole family when his whole family shall gather and this is the marriage supper of the lamb if you remember revelation chapter 19 verse 9 
Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. And blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb, the, the followers of Jesus Christ, the children of God. And he said in verse 16, I will no longer eat of it, of this, to celebrate this communion with you until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So, verse 17. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God arrives, until the millennial kingdom, as we just read in Revelation chapter 19, verse 9. Now, before we go further, I just want to point to you this in verse 17. Then he took the cup and gave thanks. Have you heard of this, the Eucharist? And in some churches, they say they, we celebrate the Eucharist. The Eucharist is the Holy Communion. It means give thanks, to give thanks. So it means the same, to give thanks, to celebrate the, the Eucharist, which is the Holy Communion. So take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Verse 19, and he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. So you see, the Eucharist, give thanks, to give thanks. Jesus used two very simple uh, elements, namely the bread and the wine. And this bread and wine, these are the emblems of the feast, or of this Holy Communion. The bread representing his broken body, body broken for us, and, and the wine, the blood that he shed for us. But even as you look at that two elements, the two frail elements, the bread and the wine, and they would spoil, I mean, those days they don't have fridge, you know, don't have storage. And this bread and this wine would spoil in a couple of days. So he used them to symbolize his body and his blood. Because in a few days, in fact, it wouldn't be a few days, because shortly, shortly, he would be killed. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. And the body broken for us. And we have seen this, we have read this even in Isaiah 53. He was abused. He was spat upon. He was, uh, 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 they put thorn of crowns, a crown of thorns on his head. And they whipped his back. Surely he was bloodied. He was broken. So this bread he took, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body. Now, I want to show you this. What does this mean? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 17. Paul wrote, For we... Though many, though we are many, are one bread. We are many people. We are many believers. We are one bread and one body. What do you think Paul was talking about? What was he referring to? He was referring to the unity. To unity. So Jesus was impressing upon his disciples at the table. One loaf. You know, one loaf. This is the bread. And he broke it. And it represents unity unity in the body of christ and you know some churches they do not break the pieces of bread or, or cut they pass the loaf around and then they tear from there that 
is one loaf, one body, one unity. And Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 3, we have been exhorted to keep the unity. So, uh, but of course today with COVID, I think uh, that, that practice has been suspended for now. So we are having separate pieces. So we have here, this is my body which is given for you. So for you means what? In our place. He took our place. And it is a sacrifice. If I can introduce, I won't say introduce, some of you know the word, but the word is vicarious. What is vicarious? To be a substitute, to take your place. You and I should have been on the cross, but Jesus took our place. This is my body which is given for you vicariously. Do this in remembrance of me, in memorial. So, we have, as I have quoted the verse to you just now, but um, uh, it's good, good to be reminded. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till He comes. It is present as often as you eat now and you drink now. You proclaim the Lord's death. You look back till He comes. You look forward into the future. Beautiful verse. And we do this in remembrance of Him, Jesus, who He is and what He has done for us. Not to remember his date of birth, not to remember his date of death, not to remember his uh, baptism or where he was buried, not to build a statue for him, but to remember Jesus and what he has done for us. And when you have the blood of Jesus applied on your heart, God will pass over your sin God will pass over your sin and God will pass over the sins of his people because of Jesus sacrifice for us his blood shed for us so verse 20 verse 20 Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. This cup is the, the new covenant. So what is the new covenant? We look at Jeremiah 31.31. 31. Because if there is a new covenant, there must be an old covenant and back in the days when Jeremiah was in ministry God spoke to him and he said behold the days are coming says the Lord when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah the old covenant as it was from the days of Moses now that was by the law, via the law, by man's effort. But now there shall be a new covenant. The old covenant, the substitute of a lamb every year. But now we have the perfect lamb sacrificed once and for all for us. And that is what he meant. I will make a new covenant. And so Jesus in verse 20 of Luke chapter 22 said so and he said this cup is the new covenant so it's not the Old Testament law this is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you in his death he must die by his death then 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 as the blood was shed and in his death so it is a new way of relating with God. And the blood has got power. It has got power. If you remember Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. 
Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, the devil, who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. The devil has been accusing us and he has been cast down. And I love verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony and they did not love their lives to the death. I will not expand or explain the full verse 11 but I just want to point to you that these believers yeah, at the end of the tribulation they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and they testified there's power in the, in the word of their testimony. There's power in the blood. They overcame the, the, the evil one, not only by the blood, but also by the blood of their testimony. So, back to Luke chapter 22, verse 20. But behold, but behold, verse 21, but behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table the one who is going to betray me is with me at the table in fact he's on the left hand side he shared the holy communion or the last supper with our lord jesus now this is mercy jesus did not identify him jesus knew who he was the betrayer but Jesus was giving him a chance, another chance to repent. But he did not. He could have said, Lord, I repent. I am so sorry. I, I know you've been giving me a lot of hands and I've, I'm taking it now and I will, I will not proceed as what I had intended to, to betray you. But he didn't. So, why choose Judas? It is to fulfill prophecy. There, prophecy in, in the in prophecy there is it is written that there shall be one who will betray Jesus Christ. Even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted in Psalm 41 verse 9. In Psalm 41 verse, verse 9, the psalmist wrote, even my own familiar friend whom I trusted. Yeah, Jesus trusted him even with the money in charge of the treasury who ate my bread, who was next to him sharing that the, the, the last supper who ate my bread has lifted up his heel against me. That means betrayed me. This is found in Psalm 41 verse 9. And even in Zechariah verse 13 verse 9 Zechariah 13 verse 9 What do we have? Ah, sorry, verse 6. And Zechariah 13, verse 6. And one will say to him, What are these words between what, what are these wounds between your arms? Then he will answer, Jesus will answer, those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. He was with friends and he was wounded. He was betrayed. So all pointing to Jesus being betrayed. So, of course, the Old Testament prophets did not name the person, but they said this event will take place. So, someone would betray Jesus. That's the first thing. Second thing we need to learn is uh, true love must be tested. True love must be tested. And even even as Jesus went all the way to the cross and he obeyed in obedience he went all the way to the cross even unto death this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased God said because this is Jesus his son who was being uh, put to the test he could have called the legions of angels to come and help him or he couldn't have, but he did not. He went all the way. And through the pages of the Bible, you would have seen 
David was tested, Abraham was tested, Moses was tested. And when God tests his people, he wants them to pass. And when they pass the test, you know, the relationship between them and God has grown, would have grown stronger. So true love must be tested. And so Judas, yes, he was selected, was chosen after an all-night prayer uh, of the amongst the, the disciples. God, you no, know, Jesus chose twelve, and he was one of them, and he was chosen. And now his love for God needs to be tested. Peter was tested, and he failed. He denied Christ once, twice, three times, but he repented and he came back to Jesus. But what about Judas? He was being tested, but he went all the way. He did not repent. So, Judas, even though there was sovereign, sovereign uh, uh, arrangement, prophecy, but individually, uh, Judas has that personal responsibility. He could have rejected this and turn around so if judas rejected and rejected his, his the religious leaders and their offers and he repent of it and and did not proceed with the betrayal so then how does the prophecy of jesus proceed how will the story go on no there will i mean god is sovereign if judas turn around and turn back to god there shall be another betrayer. God can, in His sovereign will, can find another betrayer, someone who will eventually betray Jesus. But in this case, it started and it stopped with Judas, and Judas did not repent. So he continued in his evil plan and betrayed Jesus. So that's Judas as recorded for us. So back to Luke chapter 22 Luke chapter 22 verse 22 verse 21 but behold the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table and truly the son of man goes as it had been determined but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. I just want to show you one more concerning this betrayal. Psalm 55. Do I have it? Okay. Psalm 55. Verse 12. For it is not an enemy who reproaches me, then I could bear it. Nor is it one who hates me, who has exalted himself against me, then I could hide from him. But it was you, a man, my equal, my companion, and my acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together and walked to the house of God in the throng and that is what Jesus was saying I mean that was what the psalmist said and it came to pass even in 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 in, in the betrayal of Jesus by Judas before he was arrested here what we we have we will be seeing is the worst of men because this is the this is the the, the greatest crime, the worst of men betraying the best of men. The best of men among us is Jesus. And the worst of men, Judas, betrayed the best of men. So, we will pause here. And when we come back, we will continue uh, Luke chapter 22.